continue to talk more about this, the ongoing conflict and how we got to this point and bring in author and historian Dr. Jean-Pierre Itzbouts. He's the author of Mapping America and the upcoming Mapping the Holy Land. Thanks so much for being here with us. We appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. So obviously a lot to break down here. I think we should first just start with how did we get here? This surprise attack coming on Saturday and now we're just seeing the aftermath of it. And it's been so horrific to watch this all unfold. Well, like, like you and like so many other people in, the, in our country, um, I'm just stunned and shocked by uh, this, this incredible attack by Hamas on Israel. There are a lot of questions that need to be answered in the months ahead as to why the intelligence apparatus was not, uh, which is one of the best in the world, was not better prepared uh, to anticipate this, this horrific attack. But then again, as we know, uh, Hamas is a terrorist organization, and uh, um, some of the coverage of these horrific events in the last couple of days have sort of sought to equate Hamas with uh, Palestinian cause. And we should remember that Hamas is uh, an organization that has brutally suppressed any form of dissent in the Gaza Strip, that it rules by fear, uh, that it is in no way the, uh, uh, the recognized representative of Palestinian aspirations. Um, if anything, uh, Palestine and Palestinians are represented by Fatah in the West Bank, which has tried to find a common ground with Israel, but Hamas has never uh, agreed to do so, and they, they continue to clamor for the complete destruction of Israel, which is why in my uh, estimation, this attack was clearly planned in conjunction with Iran, which is trying to scuttle the growing approchement, the growing um, um, idea of a possible peace treaty between Saudi Arabia and Israel as brokered by the United States. Uh, this clearly is not in the interest of Iran. And uh, to me, at least, it, it is clear that this attack with this incredible deployment of, of arms and militants by sea, by air and by land could not have happened except with the full support uh, of, of Iran. And uh, we can only hope that in the weeks and months to come, uh, the chances for a peace plan, a peace treaty between Saudi Arabia and Israel will not be scuttled by these developments and so giving victory to these uh, ruthless perpetrators of this great crime. Sure, and going off of that as well, the attack, of course, coming on a Jewish holiday, but uh, going off of that in the strategic aspect of this, tell us a little bit more about, uh, you know, could they have been better prepared? Could this have been prevented? That question that so many people do continue to ask. It's absolutely true that, um, you know, it, it's ironic in a way because 50 years ago we were in the same boat. Uh, 50 years ago, uh, I happened to be uh, in the uh, upper part of Israel, uh, close to the city of Kunaitra. I was a graduate student at the time, and I was exploring the north of Israel literally weeks before the outbreak of the Yom Kippur War. And at that time, too, the Israeli intelligence apparatus underestimated the movements that were clearly in the works of a new offensive on the part of Egypt and Syria against the Israeli state. Now, at the time, Golda Meir, the prime minister, was very careful not to make any preemptive moves. Israel had done that during the so-called Six-Day War in 1967, when it was clear, uh, based on its intelligence, that Egypt and Syria were about to launch an all-out war on the Israeli state. And Israel, the Israeli Defense Forces, uh, made the decision to preempt that by attacking first and destroying much of Egypt's air power on the ground. And from that point on, it was basically a foregone conclusion that Israel would win, which it did in six days. However, Israel was uh, fiercely uh, condemned by uh, world opinion for initially uh, launching this attack, even though it was clear that the Arab states were about to, uh, to create an assault. 
And so Golda Meir was very careful in 1973 not to repeat that error, uh, particularly also because uh, she knew that in the event of war, uh, Israel would be heavily dependent on reinforcements uh, and replenishment of its armed stocks by the United States. Uh, at the time, Richard Nixon was the president. He was under severe pressure from the Watergate uh, investigations. And she knew it would be very difficult for him in this context to rush to Israel's aid. So Golda Meir basically uh, allowed for a partial mobilization of uh, its forces at that time, only about 150,000 reservists, if my numbers are correct. And of course, the result of that was that Israel was uh, unprepared for the massive uh, assault that took place during Yom Kippur, uh, not only in terms of Egypt crossing the uh, the canal and entering the Sinai Peninsula, but also m m even more dangerously, the influx of a huge armada of uh, Syrian tanks in the Golan Heights. And Israel came very close to defeat in those early days. I mean, there was even thought of perhaps using nuclear uh, weapons, which fortunately they did not do. So it is uh, for, our, for people like myself who have been trying to follow the developments in the Middle East over the last couple of years, uh, a big question mark, why Israel was essentially unprepared for this massive attack by Hamas, which involved hundreds and hundreds of militants um, stockpiling of weapons and rockets, and even the deployment of uh, of aerial vehicles. I mean, they could not have done that without uh, excessive replenishment of their armed stocks by Iran and to some extent by Hezbollah in Lebanon. And the movement of those arms should have been detected um, in an ideal sense by the uh, Israeli intelligence apparatus. Uh, they did not. And uh, this is not the time to debate these questions. Right now, our focus is on protecting Israel and bringing the hostages home. Certainly, there will be uh, an extensive uh, continued bombardment of the Gaza Strip. Uh, the jury is out on the question whether there will be a ground assault uh, if the IDF decides on a ground assault, it will be an extremely protected and bloody affair, uh, both for Israeli soldiers as well as for the uh, civilian population in Gaza. So uh, we hope that that may not happen. And personally, um, uh, as someone whose heart is very much with the Israeli people, but who is also sympathetic with the plight of the Palestinians, particularly in the West Bank, I hope that uh, that at one point Egypt and other Arab nations who have typically served as mediators in these uh, situations will arrange for a ceasefire, at which point uh, uh, exchange of prisoners and hostages can be arranged. That would be an ideal situation. Uh, it would be the best, I think, for for Israel, for the Palestinian people. Ultimately, we must, we must find a peaceful solution to this conflict, uh, which is why we are so encouraged by these recent overtures to Saudi Arabia and Israel. And we cannot let that opportunity fall by the wayside. Sure, and today we heard from President Biden obviously speaking out against this, saying that we stand with Israel. We also have a tweet that we can pull up here showing that Secretary Antony Blinken says that he will also be heading to Israel as well to uh, directly show his support on the grounds and discuss ways to help in this situation. So I guess looking at this, what do you anticipate to see from here from the U.S. as we move forward and how is this going to play a role on the United States in the short and long term? Well, I, I listened to uh, some of the broadcasts coming out of uh, uh, Israel uh, over the last couple of days, and uh, not only those from the Likud party, which is currently in power, but also of the Labour Party in Israel. And one thing that the, uh, these commentators make very clear, particularly on the Labour side, is that we as a nation 
uh, and we still are the most powerful free nation in the world, must make sure that our fight against Hamas and our will to, our, our, our intent to destroy that terrorist infrastructure should not in any way bleed through into the West Bank. In the West Bank, there is an ongoing uh, constructive dialogue taking place to, uh, to help the West Bank population achieve its goals and to uh, allow it to develop economically and perhaps even politically along the lines of the Oslo Accords of 1991, which after all envisioned a sovereign Palestinian entity side by side with Israel. Um, it is the policy of the Biden administration, and, and I fully agree with that idea, that a two-state solution is still the best solution to the Middle East crisis and the ongoing tensions between Palestinians and Israel. Uh, just as Israel uh, was allowed its own state as a, re as a result of United Nations Resolution 181 in 1947, at the same time, that resolution also called for a Palestinian state. And if the Arab nations at that time had not attacked Israel in 1948 during its war of independence, uh, there would be now a Palestinian state side by side with Israel. And none of these violent wars would have occurred. It is largely due to the decision by the Arab states to negate Resolution 181 and to grab the land for itself. Let's not forget the West Bank was grabbed by the Kingdom of Jordan, Transjordan, as it was called at the time. The Gaza Strip was annexed by Egypt uh, so that it is due to the Arab states at that time that the uh, Resolution 181 did not produce the Arab state, uh, the Palestinian state rather, that uh, was envisioned to exist peacefully side by side with, with Israel. And we, we still live with the consequences of that decision uh, to this day. So my hope is that with the support of the Biden administration and by bipartisan support in the US Congress, we can return to that road of some form of uh, uh, a two-state resolution which will give Israel its security that it so desperately needs, but which will give Palestine a, a dignified way of living in a, in, a, in a modern world where they can see their children grow up and they can live a peaceful and dignified life. And one last question I want to leave you here with. We've been showing all this video of, of the destruction so far. We're now in day four of this war. How long do you think this could go on? Well, there is hope and there is reality. Uh, I, I'm, I'm afraid this will go on for a long time. Uh, the last time Israel uh, had an invasion of Gaza, it took uh, several weeks and it became a very prolonged affair. Um, terrible, terrible casualties on the ground on both sides. But from what I understand of the Netanyahu uh, coalition, um, the emotions are running very high, particularly because this is a, a coalition with uh, ultra-nationalist right-wing parties who would like to essentially uh, annex the West Bank. And I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that if the invasion or the continued uh, siege of Gaza, which is the word that's being used right now by Prime Minister Netanyahu, a complete siege of, of uh, Gaza. If it uh, is allowed to continue for a very long time, calls will go up to also deal with the West Bank, and we cannot allow that to happen. We must separate what is happening in the Gaza Strip from ongoing peace efforts, not only with Saudi Arabia, but also as it relates to the West Bank. And uh, my, my hope is that this is going to be a matter of weeks, but I gotta tell you honestly, uh, I'm afraid that, that this, this may go on for several months before we can look forward to uh, a more peaceful resolution where negotiations can take place and exchange of hostages can take place and we can bring uh, calm detentions in the, uh, in the region. 
Well, Dr. Jean-Pierre Isbas, we really appreciate you coming on to share some of your knowledge and insight into this very serious and escalating situation that we've been following, the war in Israel involving Hamas after the attack on Saturday. Thank you so much for coming on today. We really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me.